Hey, hey, everyone. Welcome to Unique Ways with Thomas Gerard and Audio Podcast. Got a really great guest on today. She's an award-winning lettering artist, author, and educator. She's worked with several high-profile clients, been on stage at dozens of design conferences, won awards, and built the business of her dreams doing what she loves. Please join me in welcoming Martina Flor. Welcome. Hi, Thomas. Thank you so much for having me. Are you ready for 20 questions? Yeah, for sure. Okay, here we go. Number one, tell me a little bit more about yourself. What do you do? So I'm a lettering artist and I'm also an author, an educator, and I help in the moment I create lettering and also I help other lettering artists and freelancers and graphic artists to improve their skills in hand lettering and also make a living doing what they love. So I also um, run a company uh, and I, uh, I'm i the leader of a team that I love and help me do all the things that we do in inside the company. Um, and we also have a community of lettering artists and, and graphic artists inside our company, which is basically the, the reason why we do everything we do. Uh, so everything from the books and the content that we that we publish and the free resources and the uh, programs that we offer everything thought with that in mind to help um, our students and the lettering artists and the graphic artists that are inside our community to to improve their skills and 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 make a living doing what they love Great. And just a note for our audience, if you guys are excited about the lettering artist angle, um, check out our recent episode with Jessica Hish, who is also a lettering artist. Um, number two, what's a key piece of knowledge that makes you different? A key piece of knowledge that makes me different has to do with the experience of going, like the, the complete roadmap of going from being a graphic designer, miserable, doing what I was doing, uh, on to transforming uh, my life and work through learning and expertise like lettering and building a business around it um, and, and, and building a business that I call is in a way a container for everything else that I have started. So inside that container, um, I have you know, I started a line of products with my work and I have also um, created books or written books and published books. Um, I have started an, an online academy uh, that nurtures hundreds of students per year. So I feel that a core piece of knowledge that I have is that I have gone through the entire transformation mm -hmm. from, you know, from learning a skill to turning that into my livelihood and being really happy at doing what I do. Great. And um, you made a note about number three, but the question is why this of all things, why do you do what you do? Because I, I didn't believe that I could do it. So when I look back to the moment where I started or where I decided to learn a skill and transform my work and, and make a career, um, with lettering, with hand lettering. Before that, before that first step that sort of kick started the rest, I didn't believe that I could do it. And everything, everything that I had learned leaned towards the fact that, you know, as an artist, I couldn't be making a living with my art, that I was too old to, to learn a new skill. Um, and by getting myself or making that first step, um, I proved myself that I, I was able to do it and that I could learn a skill, that I could start a, a business um, around my skills. And and this is why nowadays I feel that I, I want to share that with other uh, people and pave the path of other artists that like I did before, think that they are not able to do it, that they won't be able to live from their art, that they won't be able to learn a skill because they are too old or they cannot draw or the whatever uh, objections they have around it. Um, but I think that's that's the main reason that I want to, because I, I've learned uh, and I have experience, 
and I have overcome those objections and those limiting beliefs, I want to help others do the same. Perfect. And some people struggle with number four, but the question is, what does your future look like? My future looks like getting deeper into, you know, getting better at sharing the all the the knowledge, the insights that I have collected throughout the the way. Um, I think that part of my current work is to get really or to train myself in communicating better what I know in providing that specific knowledge that helps someone move forward. Um, it has to do with training myself to um, to express those insights in a way that will have an impact on someone else's life and work. So I think, you know, I, and I do that every day. I do that through uh, through writing books and through um, through creating a podcast or through writing a weekly newsletter. Mm -hmm. I try to train myself in the art of, you know, communicating things in a way that really reach uh, the heart of people and artists mm -hmm. um, out there. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, number five, uh, we say is unique to this show. The question is, let's talk about location. How does the notion of place play into what you do? Well, changing locations for me, well, I'm originally from Argentina, so I was born in Buenos Aires and I lived most of my adult life in Buenos Aires and I moved to uh, to Europe and now I live in Berlin for th over 13 years. Um, so I moved to Europe in 2008. Um, and for me, changing locations triggered a profound change in, in, in me as a person and also in my career. Um, so I feel that changing locations for me meant a lot. Um, and I think that has to do, that had to do not only, not necessarily because of the territorial aspect of changing locations, but because I inserted myself into a community of people who were doing exactly what I wanted to do. Um, so I left a community where that was full of limiting beliefs in which I was immersed at that time. And I inserted myself in a community that at that time was in, in Europe, in, in, in Berlin, which is the city where I live in right now, where, you know, possibility was the rule and where people were doing that one thing that I wanted to do. So there were act actual designers living from letter design. Uh, there were type designers who were selling their fonts to the world. And there were also <clears throat> a few lettering artists that were making a living from, from their work. And... And because I move, I, I move cities and I inserted myself in a new community where people were doing what I wanted to do, that had a profound impact on, on me believing that I could do it. Um, so I think that location plays a role in one's life if you are also immersing yourself into a new context, a new set of possibilities, in a new set of connections as well. I love that. Um, so, okay, number six, if you had to start from the beginning, what advice would you give your former younger self? I would say You can do this. And this, this that you are feeling right now is because it's part of the transition. And I'm thinking of those listening right now who are perhaps in a similar situation of um, 
of the one I was when I when I start when I when I decided to start the path of like you know learning a skill, becoming an expert in lettering and and changing my career. Um, I know that there is a lot of self doubt and a lot of questioning in in that in that process. And if anything, I would love to go back and tell myself like, well, th this is normal. It's not that you're broken or you have a problem or you don't have what it takes. It's just that this is part of the process of becoming a better version of yourself. Um, so I think this is what I would go back to tell myself that everything is going to be fine, that what I'm feeling is normal and it happens to everybody. And that is just part of, of, of the growth that I'm experiencing. Great. And what's the day in your life like? A day in my life is nowadays starting very early. We wake up at 6.30. I have two young uh, or uh, small kids, uh, a five and an eight year old um, um, sons. And uh, yes, so we wake up pretty early and uh, normally with one of them in our bed. <laughs> and then um, the day kickstarts with breakfast together. And then um, I would take one of the kids to school or the, the kindergarten. And after that, I will go for a workout. And I'm a person who works out on her own. I just take my weights and I go to a public space, to a park or whatever, and I just train on my own, uh, which makes me really proud because I, I keep the promise to myself and I continue do that, doing that every day. Mm -hmm. And after that, I just, um, even though people just walks by and looks at me and they wonder like, what the hell am I doing uh, training in the public space on my own? But I just do it. And then I I walk to my studio or I bike to my studio. I, I live pretty close by from where I work. Um, it's like a 15 minute walk along the canal, which is one of the favorite parts of my day. And then I will sit down to um, to work in my computer. What I do in, you know, and this is related to one of the, the first questions that you um, that you asked me. What I do nowadays is that the first thing that I do is that I sit down to write. So I am working on a book and I write a little bit every day. So before I do anything else, before I open emails, before I I open my Asana app or, you know, I even, yeah, start working on the projects that we are currently working on, I write. And, um, and I do this because I want to put first in the day um, I want to put first the things that are kind of like my future and, and the things that are, um, very important to me. Right. So this is, this is a very important, a, a very important thing to me just to, to work on developing that skill of mine of like expressing ideas and, and, and conveying concepts. So I write, uh, early in the morning. Um, and then I would just, uh, open my Asana app and just start to work. And I go about my day as well, um, you know, tackling the tasks first that have to do with the very essential things that move my projects forward. And then by the end of the day, I will read emails. Um, so that was a change that I, I implemented in the last uh, years, which is really a game changer. Um, instead of reading emails in the morning, I would just do that in the late afternoon um, so that I can focus on creating work or tackling the tasks that are really uh, that really matter to me without distractions. Um, yes, and then I will have a check-in per day with my team. We have a 50 minutes check-in and then everyone works on their own um, things. And then I will go back to... Uh, to my uh, place and just, yeah, hang out with the family. I normally finish my day, uh, my day of work at four or like, yeah, 4 p.m. So it's kind of like a short day for me. Um, but I have realized throughout 
time that the shorter my day, the more efficient I am. Mm -hmm. So I try to keep it short so that I, yeah, so that I, you know, I have great free time to enjoy with family or friends or working out or doing other things. Great. And uh, lifelong learning is a popular topic. How do you stay up to date? Uh, can you repeat the question? Yes. Lifelong learning is a popular topic. How do you stay up to date? Oh, yeah, I read a lot. Mm -hmm. I read, I read a lot. I read every night. Um, and I, yeah, I'm an avid read reader. I guess I stay up to date uh, because I continue learning um, through reading a lot. And I also, um, I also have coaches, so I either use coaching programs or um, or hire coaches through the uh, business coaches uh, for a specific uh, moments of my uh, of my business. Um, I also learn through therapy, so I go to uh, to therapy every week. And that also gives me a lot of tools to understand my feelings and and to grow as a leader and to stay, to keep my mind fresh in a way. Um, yeah, but I think if I have to narrow it down, it will be a combination of reading a lot and like kind of following my interests. I, what, what I do normally is that I, I feed, I feed a certain, or I try to compensate a certain lack of knowledge with the books that I read. So if I need to tackle a specific um, challenge in my business, for instance, or in my work, and I feel that I don't have enough tools, I will start by reading books and kind of getting insights or information about the topic. And if I feel that's not enough, then I will go deeper into um, coaching or coaching programs um, so that I can implement those things that I, I learned through books. Um, but yeah, I would say that it's a combination of reading a lot, um, training myself with people that have more knowledge than me in a certain area, and also um, getting to know myself through therapy. Great. And you mentioned tools a few times, but the question is, what tools do you use? Do you use digital and analog tools? Oh, yeah. So when I create lettering, I use analog tools. I use um, the good old pencil and paper. And I also use tracing paper, which is something pretty particular of my technique. Um, so I use tracing paper on my... Um, on the sketching phase of a lettering piece. Um, so I will start by just drawing on paper with pencil, and then I will use this tracing, these layers of tracing paper uh, to refine the, the drawing in layers. And then I would, you know, most of my work is digital or has a digital outcome. So I would just move those, uh, later I would just move those sketches to, uh, to a computer and I will, um, Kind of redraw the whole thing but with vectors so i normally use um adobe illustrator the good old adobe illustrator and um i use a wacom ta tablet which is essentially like the two tools that help me um trace and 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 reshape those sketches that i did by hand onto a vector graphic and and I love the digital part of the process as much as the analog part. Like I feel that the analog part, the sketching is the 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 part that is very experimental for me. Like I try a lot of different things. And then when I move to the computer, I can get really detailed onto, you know, achieving the perfect curve through through the vector graphics and and choosing the exact color that I want for a certain design or adding the textures that make it look um, more natural or add a certain tactile effect. So I love the possibilities of the two worlds, the analog, because it gives you like that quick result. You can, you know, by sketching something, you can 
you can try a lot of different things in very few times. So in a couple of minutes, I can try a lot of different directions for a single design. And, and when you move on to the digital drawing, at least in, in my world, the world of lettering and digital lettering, when I move to the digital drawing, I love that it picks up a different pace, a slower pace, but at the same time, it gives you that precision that is like beautiful. It's like where you can kind of reach perfection in a certain design. Great, and can you talk more about work-life balance? Work-life balance. I think this is perhaps particular to me because I work or my work is very much aligned with what I love doing and and all of the projects and the things that we do in, in my company and my studio are very much self-initiated and are things that I want to do. Um, so in a way, there's no, I don't see work as a separate things, think from personal life. Um, so everything is kind of like, um, together, right. In the same, it leaves in the same space. Um, however, with the time I have, I have learned to be more present in each moment so that when I'm with kids, I try not to be thinking necessarily on work stuff. I try to stay away from social media, from my phone, um, so that I can really enjoy every every moment that I'm with them. And at the same time, when I'm at work, I don't want to, I also leave my phone pretty far away from, I never leave my phone on the desk. Uh, I close my, uh, my email app. So I try to ver be very intentional in, um, in, being where I am and doing the thing that I'm doing. Um, but I do think that work and life are just one for me. And everything that is, um, every element of it makes my life. The elements of work, the elements of my personal life, they all, they are all um, bound together in my life. Um, so yeah, I don't feel that I need to balance them out. I just want to intentionally be present in each one of the elements when I'm working on on them. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, okay. um, so if you weren't doing what you do now, what would you be doing? I I think I would be dancing. I would be doing something with my body for sure. Like I feel that um, I would, you know, my my work is very, um, yeah. There's a lot of like thought and and um, conceptualizing and thinking, and I would love to be to have the body more involved in my daily life. I think that there is something really magnetic, or at least for me, there's something really magnetic from, um, of seeing a, in a sportsman or woman. I love watching like sport competitions because it just amazes me how, how someone can get to control their body in such a way or to dominate their body in such a way that they can achieve the exact result they are looking for the same way that I can achieve this, the exact result that I'm looking for with a certain design or with a certain um, lettering piece or with a certain um, book that I'm writing. Um, I, I kind of admire someone doing that with their body by dominating that tool that is in their case their muscles um their arms their um, legs so i think if in my case if i wouldn't be doing what i do i would be using my body fully in either dancing or being a dancer or uh, being a sportswoman <laughs> 
Great. And number 12, what would you not like to do with your career? That's such a great question. I wouldn't like to... limit myself by the things that I have done in the past. Mm. Uh, because I think that oftentimes your achievements can become also your um, your cage. Uh, and because people recognize you for a certain thing, uh, you feel drawn or pushed to continue doing the same thing. So if anything, and I, I know for a fact and firsthand that it's not easy to um, to explore new paths like other than the ones you already know. Um, so what I wouldn't like for my career is to let that be stronger than my wish to explore new stuff and to discover new ways in which I can um, make an impact in the world and 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 make a difference with what I have to share. Great. And 13, do you have a favorite word, quote, or sentence? Again, C can you repeat? Yeah. Do you have a favorite word, quote, or sentence? Yes, I had the chance once to illustrate a a quote by someone that, of course, I don't remember who said it. Um, it's something like, whatever you want to do, do it now. Mm. Conditions are always impossible. And there's a, a let me just look for it. Um, and there's something so powerful in this phrase, because I think that most of us, we, whenever, um, whenever we want to do something that scares us, we, the first thing that we think about is how, you know, all the things, all the reasons why we shouldn't be doing this. And the truth is that, yes, conditions are always impossible. Like, for instance, for, for, for me, when, when I decided to have kids or we, we just decided to go ahead and try to have kids uh, with my husband, you know, I was in the midst of my career as a lettering artist. Uh, we, were, we were living in a small apartment. Uh, we were um, just barely making ends meet, like conditions are always impossible. If I have to think now of having a kid again, and even when all these problems are solved, there's another set of problems for which I wouldn't have a kid. And the, th the thing, I think that that applies also for many other things that you want to start or accomplish in your life. Um, and the, by the way, the quote is by Doris Lessing. So the quote is whatever, whatever you mean you're you're meant to do do it now the conditions are always impossible mm. so i think this is a great reminder the the fact that there was there will always be reasons why you shouldn't be do, doing something now the real question is why why you you should right and why why is that so important that it keeps coming back to you Great. And how about a least favorite word, quote, or sentence? I want to have to think about. Nothing comes to mind. Okay. Nothing um, really comes to mind. Okay. And 15, if you had to pick one word to describe yourself, what word would you choose?
I'm somewhere between fearless and resilient. So what I don't like about fearless is that it implies that I don't fear anything. Um, but I always say that it, it scares me more the fact that I won't, like not trying, that actually trying and failing. So in that sense, I think I'm, fearless um, because I'm not afraid of trying new things or I am afraid of trying new things, but I would do it anyways. Um, and I think that it has been present all throughout, throughout my life, at least the last 20 years of my life where I, I've done things that are really scary. I moved to, you know, I moved overseas from South America to Germany, which is pretty different in a lot of senses, uh, not only the climate and the, the language, but also some pretty radical cultural differences. Um, I've also started a new career in my thirties. I've also um, started a studio in an industry that is male dominated and I, done this also as an immigrant, which adds a, a new level of complexity to the whole thing. Um, so I think that fearless would be a, a good, um, a good word to describe me, not because I don't fear things, but because I would do it anyways. And mm. I would, I'm always, I'm always, and this is something that I, I, try to share with with other people that I work with often, which is like, if you if you focus on the outcome or what is what it is there for you when you overcome a certain thing or once you have done a, a certain thing, it's much easier to do that thing than by focusing in the actual challenge you have in front of you. Um, because fear is really, um, limiting and it's it really freezes you up and if you focus yourself in what is for you behind overcoming that fear then this is what will set, set you in motion and I think this is something that I, I've always done which is like always focusing on the possibilities that are behind that fear that I feel at the moment um and that are what that is the thing that has set me in motion um throughout all challenges Great. And final stretch here. What keeps you up at night? What keeps me up on, at night is when there's something threatening what I have built or something very important in my life. Mm -hmm. So whenever I feel that there's something happening uh, that is threatening, for instance, my work, my company, my team, uh, or my family, that keeps me up at night. Because, you know, at the, at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that you cannot control. Um, there's a lot of things that, yes, that are out of your control. Even, even when I would love to have everything under my control, there's a lot of things that are outside of control. And I think that when I, when I see a glimpse of, of that reality, um, that is what would keep me up at night. And I will give you a very silly example, perhaps, um, to explain a very deep concept like this one because I'm speaking about, you know, threatening something that really matters to you. And that I think that a lot of the listeners will resonate with, with that. Uh, when you feel that there's someone or something threatening, something that really matters to you is, yeah, it's, um, it's really stressful. 
And it has happened recently in my business that they hacked uh, one of our social media accounts. And, um, and when that happened, they also, they got into our accounts and they got into our content and also they were posting on our behalf and they were uh, taking money out of the business as well. So that was a very um, scary situation to go through. And that, that situation really made me think how vulnerable things are, right? How vulnerable, um, how someone can come and just get into your stuff and, 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 um, affect something that you were doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, just, just to give you a very silly example, I know for many listeners will be like, well, it's a social media account. It's not that important. But when you think about that as an asset of your business, of your life, a place or a channel through which uh, you share a lot of um, thoughts and a lot of useful information for other people or where you connect with other people, then, you know, the, things start taking another level. Um, so I think that it would be a situation in which I would say like, it would keep me up at night. Um, and anything that is related to, yeah, threatening what I have built throughout the years with, uh, with my studio and my team, and also what I have built throughout the years with my family, I think that that would keep me up at night. Great, and 17, what's the dream you're chasing? I think the dream I'm chasing has two sides, which I mentioned before in a certain way. First, becoming a better version of myself at a lot of different levels so that I can communicate, explain, share insights and learnings that I have learned throughout the, the way. Um, and the dream is that these insights or my way of sharing these insights and these tools and this information will positively impact the, the life of other creatives or artists out there. Mm. That would be the dream. Great. And what inspires you? What inspires me is people who can do that, who can, through the right words, the right um, writings, the right books, the right uh, podcasts, the right videos, uh, the right uh, YouTube videos, they can they can share something in a way that touches you and that makes you take action. Um, I think this is, this is really inspiring when someone can find the right combination of words, visuals, um, resources, sound, music to touch you in a certain way and to really transform you at least for a minute. And, and if you can do that, um, for a longer time, for a longer period of time, if you can impact the life of someone for a longer period of time, then that's super inspiring. Great, and last couple here, any advice you'd like to share? Yes, I remember that and this is also related to some of the things that we were just talking about. Um, I remember that I used to have a teacher, a type design teacher, um, who always reminded me about the power of seeing things on paper. So I used to be, you know, as a, as a creative, I used to come to him with a lot of different ideas, or I want to create this, or I want to do 
this design that looks like this or like that. And I want to also uh, draw the serifs in this way so that they look in that way. And he will always remind me to like draw it, right? To just put it on paper and see if it works. Mm -hmm. And that drawing will inform my next steps. And I think I have implemented that not only in my work, but also in my life. I've always... I've always taken that first step that would inform the rest. Um, I've always applied that one learning into, if I have a plan, let's make that first step. Let's make that first drawing and see if that works or not. Per perhaps it's not something that is worth pursuing, uh, but perhaps it is. But you get to see that and you get to decide that once you make that first steps. Mm -hmm. As long as it is in your mind, it is just in your mind. It will never become a thing. Great. And number 20, how can our listeners keep tabs on you? What's their call to action? So my your listeners can um, stay in touch with me through my social media networks. So Instagram, I'm at, at Martina Flor. Um, you can always check out my website. I share a lot of things, as I, as I mentioned before, I share a lot of the things that I have learned throughout the way as, as a lettering artist, as, you know, as a graphic designer who learned a craft at, in their thirties and transformed her career uh, into um, doing the work she loves. Um, so I share a lot of these insights on my website through resources. Um, I also have a newsletter that I, that I send every week that you can sign up on martinaflor.com forward slash lettering tips. It is not only lettering tips, it's a lot of other things that have to do with, you know, making a living with your skills and, and um, yeah, and becoming a graphic artist. Um, so I would say that. So my Instagram account, my website and newsletter, and also I have a podcast just like you, Thomas, uh, the podcast is called Open Studio. And in this podcast, I, I interview other lettering artists and illustrators, but also I share um, tactics or strategies that I use in my business to simple things like finding clients or promoting myself or, you know, building a portfolio. Um and also other mindset tips that I share uh, with my listeners. So you can check it out. It's Open Studio, Martina Flores Open Studio. You can find it on all platforms, all podcast platforms. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining. You know, for our audience, definitely you guys all check out Martina Flores stuff. It's great. You'll find it on Google as well. Um, thank you so much. So inspiring. Thank you so much, Tomas, and have a beautiful day.